All right, once again, good afternoon, and sorry for the slight delay. Uh, we had some, I've forgotten to send the meeting ID to our participants, so I apologize for that. And welcome to part four of the five part series of Diana 50. It's Crossroads and it's Diaspora. Where are we heading and how are we getting there? Um, many are stressing entrepreneurship. Why an entrepreneurship driven uh, economy? There is no disguising the phenomenal scale of work, commitment, and seriousness that needs to be inputted before Guyana can lay claim to being entrepreneurship driven. It demands a complete change of culture and attitude. Not only that, there needs to be a new wave of collaboration and joint working among the government, Guyanese at home and Guyanese in the diaspora. Government, of course, can certainly assist in this effort to build bridges and link the two communities. The past several weeks, Guyanese have loaned their voices to these discussions. In the process, we learned some very, val very valuable lessons. We must continue to engage each other in the sharing of ideas and solutions, but in a respectable way. We should have a national project and a theme, apart from the basic needs of a family, food, health, clothes, shelter, and education, Guyanese want their country to move forward. People want to be respected and have a voice in the development of their country. The, the Honorable Joseph Harmon, Minister of State, was on CWS journeys last Tuesday. One of the things he stressed was the government's commitment to developing the infrastructure, infrastructure to encourage and sustain entrepreneurship. What I would ask everyone this afternoon is to let us continue the discussions and expand on the idea of a national project and how we can move the country forward. Um, the, let me bring everyone in. I'm not sure who is there with us right now. Is that you, Alan? Alan, can you hear me? Alan, can you hear me? Ramona, let's, let's. <laughs> I would really would like everybody to get started. Um, Alan, can you hear me? Let me take a quick break and see if I can get Alan and the others on. Richard, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Um, who else is on with you? I think it's Alan. Okay, Alan. So we are waiting for Malcolm to join us. Yes. All right. Um, technology is fascinating. Let's get started. Welcome to CWS as it is, and um, thank you for lending your voices to these discussions this afternoon. The question I want to start with is, why does any of you think that we need to have these kinds of discussions on Guyana at 50, its crossroads, and its diaspora? Richard, you're on camera. You might as well go. Okay. All right. So one of the things, that's a very important thing that you, that you asked. When we look at the history of Guyana, pre and post, um, colonial uh, emperor, we are 15 years, and we're still going everywhere young. Now, one of the things that you really require with see is that the diaspora community, we have a lot of knowledge and skills that we can bring to our country. And we collect those resources. It's one of the most important things. So having this discussion on this forum, giving us ideas on how to build the core of our platform in the Yanis, so we as the community, the diaspora community, can come together on the one on the one in the end, to do a lot of work that is needed, supported by the NGOs, national organizations, and even the government. We understand that the Vietnamese government cannot do it on their own. So we are here to basically give level assistance, skills, knowledge, and expertise in whatever we are here to have. So I think it's very important to continue this conversation. Um, Ramona, you want to you want to go next? Yeah. Um, with respect to uh, entrepreneurship in Guyana. I definitely think that as we look forward to the continued growth and development of Ghana, that that is going to become more and more important, that there is a culture of, of facilitating 
uh, you know, businesses by entrepreneurs in Guyana because they're the ones with the ideas and the drive and the energy to try to put them through and provide some, some of the, and try to fill some of the needs that the government as a, as a whole can't fill itself. So I think it's a, it's an important conversation and one that we should be trying to talk about and, you know, try to reflect on how, what, what shape or form that would take. Uh, Alan, you want to get in here? I wonder, is Alan hearing me? Alan, do you, Alan, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear us? We can hear you, Alan. All right, while, while Alan is getting that fixed, here's the other question. Um, Diane is at a crossroads. One way leads to exclusivity and status quo of the past, the other to a decent and inclusive modern state. Guyana's diaspora be part of this calculus. And the consensus is yes, it should be. And we have, we have all agreed on it. But I'm always eager to hear people's opinion. Should it be part of the calculus? And can you share some ideas on how we can get, how we can move this country forward? Richard, you want to go? Sure. Um, one of the things that I see, especially from the African community, is actually on within one of the issues. The third of the issue is the honored, the citizens of the honored, the initial party in the schools. Now, one of the things that I'm looking at is the two spectrums when it comes to the one. You can do it on a micro level, meso level, or on a macro level. Now, the micro is what the individuals do some family. The metro is basically working with small groups, and the macro is basically the larger society at large. Now, one of the things for us as the African is to figure out where do we fall under those two spectrums. Now, creating a platform, syndicating the social there, whereby we can basically go here virtually and figure out what are the needs. So this is where we can come along here as a diaspora community, what are our expertise, create a direction. So when we go and we basically take on to that direction, we can see all of those, what are their expertise, what are their knowledge, what are their skills, etc. Et so this is where we can form a cohesion. Instead of basically doing the diaspora work from an individual perspective, we have to do it from a community perspective. And I think that is the thing that we're trying to do. Bring us together on the one platform, one discussion, and try to find ways and means how to move forward. I don't know if it's just me, but you're not coming over too clear. Did you get that, Ramona? Yes. You're not coming over clear, Richard. It's kind of like muffled. Not, not entirely muffled, but you're not coming over crystal clear. Um, are you, I don't know if, I, I just see your, um, your Wi-Fi went into the red. Are you close to your router or far away? Slightly far away. Slightly far away. All right, that might be one of the problems. It's, okay. it, it's not coming over clear. So, Alan, are you on with us? Alan's still not here. Alan. I don't know what happened to Alan. Alan, are you on with us? Okay, Alan is gone. Um, let me talk with Ramola for a while. Why do you get that situated, uh, Richard? Is that fair enough? Sure, let me log on, log off, and then log in back. All right, good. And let me get Ramola, Ramola on the screen. So, Ramola, here you are. You're no stranger to this camera. Right. <laughs> um, the same question. Let's... Should... Well... Diana being the, the diaspora being part of this whole effort rather than should it be part of the effort. The diaspora being part of this effort. Um, can you share some ideas on how we can help to move this country forward? Okay, that's kind of a <laughs> tough question. Um, because I think uh, moving the country forward would you know, require... I want to, re I want to calibrate that. Right. Let, let, let me, let, this is not fair. It is not fair. 
I mean, as an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us what you do and in what way you can make a contribution to Guyana in the context of what you do? Right. So, uh, uh, so in terms of being an entrepreneur, I, I function in two different er areas. Uh -huh. I'm an entrepreneur as a lawyer and I'm an entrepreneur as a film person. Um, so I'm, I'm really big on uh, the arts in general, specifically film, but the arts in general. And I, so I do see like the need for there to be um, more of a reverence, for lack uh -huh. of a better word, with respect to the way that we view the arts and how it can be used to help develop the country. So, you know, arts related activities generate income. And that, that could be a sector um, in terms in, on a macro level, yes. on, a, um, on the level of the government. Um, it can be a sector that can generate, can, that can create jobs and can generate income for the country um, if done well. Um, and, I, and on a spiritual level, in terms of people who are living in Guyana, mm -hmm. having access to world class art and culture, I think is very important in terms of the, the development of individuals and the, the, you know, people living in the country as a whole. Uh, Guyana has a very strong track record in terms of oral traditions, in terms of sculpture and theater. But there are other forms of art and there are new forms of art that are being developed now and encouraging people to you know, pursue those, those other arts or arts in general as a career and figure out how to make it um, something that's viable with the help of the government um, you know, I think would go a long way in rounding out the way in which we are approaching, you know, moving forward and growing as a country. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question many people ask. Why is Guyana with so much potential constantly in an economic struggle? I mean, it's, I know it's a broad question. Right. And it, it, it's, it's... Richard, are you back with us? Yes, I am. You want you want to touch on that a little? Um, oh, well, Alan, you're, Alan, you're back. Yes. Awesome. So, Richard, you want to you want to touch on that? How could a country with so much potential be in a constant economic struggle? I'll touch on that in two ways. First of all, um, being a social worker, one of the things I always look at is the history, and Ghana has. As I said before, we're 60 years, and our family is pretty much a young country. Now, the history basically plays a lot. Where we work, we inherit a lot of debt. When the colonialism era is basically finished, what the debts that were there, we basically inherit. And that basically put a, a burden on the nation as a whole. Uh -huh. So, we to remove those debts, and by... Doing this it basically caused a lot of social issues and a lot of problems. Now, to follow up with this, one of the things is that I'm not a policy maker, but I'm very interested in seeing how the policies that we have basically contributed to this. It is my opinion that policies definitely, probably, did make an impact on the current situation. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things I look at, and I look at it from a social work point of view. Can this 83,000, I asked this question last week, can this 83,000 square miles of complication become the pioneer of the region in feeding, clothing, and housing itself? Your thoughts, uh, Richard? Yes, and the reason why I'm smiling is that I recall a lot of stories my dad, when he was a youth who up in Guyana, and he told me of stories coming from the island of Leg One. The island of Leg One is basically 18, um, 18 square miles. 18 square miles, I think, if I remember correctly. But it had 16 to 18 rice factories. And those rice factories produced enough rice that were exported to the Caribbean and also utilized within Guyana. So the thing is, I personally feel yes. When you look at the context of our history, we still have the potential. What has happened between 1966 to the present era is a good question. And a lot of us may ponder on it, but one of the most important things is this. We may have a lot of ideas. We use our mental models. 
But one of the things that I really, really want to see is this, research. So the question that you're asking me, you can give opinions, but through research, you're going to definitely find the answers to those questions and many more of the things that we need to be able to solve in the end. Um, Mark, um, Alan, you, are you there? Yes, I'm listening to you, Sylvan. Okay, Thank awesome, you. good. Um, same question. This 83,000 square miles of complication, you think this can be the, uh, um, the pioneer of the region in feeding, clothing, and housing itself? I, from my little experience, I've been here, what, six years now since I've returned to living the island. Uh, we've had a new government for about 10 months, that I stand corrected there. Yeah. A lot of ministers who were learning on the job. What, in my experience, has been an issue for me personally as a business one, uh, while I have no problems with the policies which the government seems to want to implement, but is the implementation of said policies. I have issues in, in the way in which they want to do stuff, like this issue with banning things. I'm not one for an agreement with something like that at all. There was no consultation done with certain businesses before the government decided in the budget to ban something. And I find that rather strange because you have a lot of small businesses that are dependent on, let me be precise, there's this used tire issue in Guyana, which is close to my heart. It fights one of my businesses. What I think the government should have done is consult with the importers. We should have had proper policing of said quality of used tires being imported into Guyana. Instead, we have a wholesale across the board where the guys bring in almost anything and pay, of course, the usual raise to get it past the authorities. So we have a system where it's not working. But so the government has decided we want to get rid of used tires, we're going to ban it. No, that's not the way forward. We have a lot of small businesses, organizing shops, which have created employment for a lot of young people and small entrepreneurs in this country, and they're, they're self-employed. When you ban new styles, you put them out of business. You have about 60% of the population who drive taxis which they rent from individuals. They cannot even afford to buy the new styles. I'm telling you this as a fact. These guys come into the organizing shop and pay for two tires and credit the other two. Could you believe that? Credit it. So if you ask them to spend $40,000 on two tires, it's not going to happen. So the policy sometimes which governments make, I feel, are inhibiting progress in this country and inhibiting business. Now, at this point in time, Guyana needs business more than anything else. The economy is moving slow like the rest of the world. And if we decide that we're going to shut down some of the economy that's contributing towards it meaningfully, and I know that because I pay taxes, and I'm sure there are other people who pay taxes, and they're deriving a benefit from us. And you put us out of business, you're putting us at a disadvantage from collecting much needed revenue to carry out policies which the government needs to do. All this money they're spending cleaning up Georgetown, which is much needed infrastructure. Where is this money going to come from? What do you think what do you think should have should have been done? And and is it practical? For the government to you, you you mentioned consult consult with the with the businesses or so on. Is that for generally wide consultation, not necessarily with the businesses. Uh -huh. Generally, I do not say the government should consult and everything. Don't get me wrong. Right. But no consultation has been done. And a typical example is there going to, there's going to be a forum on Wednesday after the fact with the use side in for the customs have invited us to come to a meeting. So that should have been done months ago. So we are now consulting after the fact. And I keep telling people I have no problems with used tires and new tires working alongside each other. Because in Western societies, you guys know, you can you have a choice. You can buy an A grade used tire, or you can buy a new tire for your car. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. If the time, people the same choice. We are not a first world country. Why should we restrict ourselves? I don't, I don't want to go too deep into that particular um, 
issue because it's just one of many that anyone could point to. But um, point taken out of, all right, and I hope that the right ears are listening and there can be some kind of a solution or compromise with this. What, what I'm saying also, Selvin, it has been a prerequisite of this present government since they've been in power to do things without, cons without consulting in a major way in certain businesses. Oh. They've restricted certain things, they've improved certain things, but they've done it on a dictatorial manner, which I must admit, I'm shocked. Let me... Let, that's the way that they should go. Let me, um, let me shift a little bit to the diaspora question, right? You, you, you repatriated um, Alan, and you're an entrepreneur, you're working, you, you, you have your business in Guyana. But how, how should Guyana address the, the on top skills and expertise in the diaspora? What are some, what are some ideas you, you think that they can uh, use to facilitate this? The first question I think the government needs to ask is what skills are needed. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't think we understand fully well what's needed in Guyana by the government. Or the government themselves at this point in time understand what is needed. Because we have all the skills that's needed to take this country forward in whatever sector, in whatever area you might think it is needed. But for some strange reason, the sources are not being tapped into and it's not being used. And I say this loosely because my skill set is I'm a supply chain manager. And I don't think there's any qualified supply chain manager. And I stand corrected with my experience of working in China, Hong Kong, Dubai, in England, in Guyana. And I've never been asked a question by this government. And there are some people who know what I've done in the past. I've volunteered my skills free to assist with a problem they had in the Ministry of Health. Nobody got back to me up to now. Seriously. What are you? I paid for my skills to help the government. I'm quite happy to volunteer my skills free for now. Uh, is, is this something common you're hearing among your peers, uh, people who have repatriated? There's, there's this sort of uh, uneasiness that you're looked at like an outsider, simply because you are not been living in Ghana for the last 10, 15 years. People seem to think that somewhere along the line you ran away and you were enjoying the good life. And basically, we've been to the grinding stone here and basically, we need to look at you slightly different. Or basically, we don't trust you. I don't understand it. It's, it's an uneasy. Uh, and, and this, this is. Alan, this uneasiness is coming from where? This uneasiness is coming from the average person on the ground? There are a few people in authority who seem to look at you as an outsider. I'll tell you what, I was at the forum, and a gentleman made a comment about the oil industry. And I said, well, I've worked in Angola, and I've got the skills that any other company needs when they come to Ghana. And we were talking about expats coming to Ghana and taking the jobs. And his word was, he don't think that they should bring in experts here when we have Chinese here who may not have the right amount of skills but just have that close to them. He said, that's not how the oil industry works. The oil industry pays top dollar for the best of the business and they will bring the best from whoever you are, wherever you are. His words is, I said, well, they're Chinese, they need skills working in Dubai right now. We should be looking to bring them home. Oh, but I don't see why they should get jobs in front of Chinese people. They are they Chinese? Oh, well, they're overseas based Chinese. Any anybody?